<clears throat> Let us now turn to our scripture reading uh, for uh, this morning. Our sermon is based on Second Peter chapter three, verses eight to eighteen. I will be using uh, the ESV uh, for this portion of the service. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter three. Verses 8 to 18, uh, Peter is addressing uh, the people of God, <clears throat> and he's talking about the scoffers that will come in the last days with scoffing. They say, where is, his, where is the promise of his coming? And uh, Peter is quick to point out that they deliberately overlook the fact that the heavens existed long ago, the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that was destroyed by the flood. They deliberately deny that fact. And he said it is by that same word of the power of God that the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. And so we pick up right there, verse 8, <clears throat> and we'll conclude with uh, the last uh, verse, verse 18. Verse 18 is the text for this morning, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we'll begin with verse 8. <clears throat> But do not overlook this uh, one fact, beloved, <clears throat> that with the Lord one day is as a thousand uh, years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, with which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. <clears throat> so the title of today's message is Growth in the Life of Christ, Impediments, Provisions, and Goals. So the questions for this morning are simply, are you dealing with the impediments to growth? Are you using the provisions for growth? And are you reaching uh, the goals of growth? <clears throat> I 
Remaining time, remaining time. What kind of time do we have remaining here on this earth? Um, I can't think of a better biblical summation of what our remaining time here should look like than this particular portion of God's word. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Our growth in the life of Christ is a wonderful summation. It's a command, but it's, it's more than a command. It's more than the revealed will of God for our lives. It's a challenge. It's a challenge because God has redeemed us, it is true. And as far as justification is concerned, we need to do nothing for our salvation is based on the merits of Christ. And yet, when we deal with sanctification, we're told to be perfect. And we have this remaining corruption, and this is by God's design. We have this remaining corruption to deal with. And so the Apostle Paul says, I am going to use every ounce within me uh, to pursue perfection, knowing full well that I cannot attain it because I am still struggling in this body of sin. And I am wait awaiting the day of glorification where my, uh, I will receive my redeemed body, my glorified body. It's a challenge. But it's even more than a challenge. It's a cheer. It's a cheer for, the God, for God's people. For whoever you are, at whatever part um, of your life you find yourselves, you hear this command, and it comes to you as a great encouragement and a wonderful promise of God um, that he will enable you through his spirit and by the word to grow in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's addressing Christians, Christians who have been justified and who are, yes, positionally sanctified before God, but progressively we're struggling against uh, sin as we wait for Christ's uh, coming. <clears throat> so there's a context in which we see our passage, but grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord of uh, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ but grow he says because he's dealing with the context that we read earlier um, the context of others who are uh, not interested in submitting themselves to the Word of God when we talk about this um, this command, this challenge, this cheer, but grow. We're dealing with those things that we need to turn from, <clears throat> those things which we need to repent of. And the context makes it clear. When we consider this address to our hearts, but grow, we need to acknowledge that we are made of three essential parts. We have our minds, and our minds need to be rightly informed by the word of God in orthodoxy. We have wills, <clears throat> which need to be rightly informed in orthopraxy. And we have emotions, which need to be rightly informed in orthopathy. And they all work together, much like a stool. And in the Christian life, what we understand is that all three need to be connected. And, and, and the problems start to arise when there's a disconnect between our minds and our wills, or our wills and our emotions, or our emotions and our minds. And the Word of God addresses all that we might be perfect, Pursue that perfection uh, in Christ 
and become more and more mature and in his likeness. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ is our Redeemer, and he has fulfilled in his three offices of prophet, priest, and king uh, everything we need for godliness and for holiness. He has given us knowledge and righteousness and holiness. Um, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, and, and again in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, that we're to put off, put off the old self and put on the new, which is created after God's image in knowledge and righteousness and holiness. And each one pertains to these aspects of our mind and our wills and our emotions. And as I said, if there's a disconnect, that's where the impediment comes. We have to remove ourselves from the impediments or remove the impediments from our lives. It's plain, it's simple. If we, there's so many passages of scripture that we know, but we don't think about it in these terms. Um, you think of the text, uh, don't be just hearers of the word, using your minds to process the word of God. You know, there are plenty of people who work at understanding uh, the scriptures rightly, and then they say that they're being rightly informed, uh, but it has no impetus in, in, in get, getting them motivated to do it, the word of God. And so, what do we hear? Don't be just hearers of the word, but doers. There's a connection. There are those who hear the word of God and they want to speak to other people and um, show how much they know, but it's not connected to the emotional aspect of who they are, their orthopathy. And so the word of God comes and says, speak the truth. Know the scripture in your mind, that's right, use your mind, but speak the truth in love. Let your emotions be transformed as well after the image of God or the likeness of God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> we're told in other passages of scripture that we're not to be tossed about in emotional upheaval by every wind of doctrine that comes, comes by. So we have to be grounded in the Word of God. There has to be that connection between all three aspects. How beautiful is the Word of Christ that brings all three into focus when we think about it in these terms. Um, if you love me, the emotional orthopathy being touched, you will keep the motivational aspect of our wills being rightly informed. You will keep my commandments, my word, orthodoxy. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And the passage is quite clear. Paul, uh, Peter uh, speaks of the sinful desires in verse 4. He speaks um, <clears throat> in verse 16 <clears throat> of their constant twisting of scriptures to fit their own emotional uh, needs. Um, verse 17, they do whatever they will. Okay? And so we need to operate much like that three-legged stool operates. All three need to be connected so that we are stable, so that we are um, secure in our salvation. <clears throat> you know that there is a, um, a personality test uh, out there, and it's a, it's a pretty big business. Um, a lot of different corporations, uh, institutions uh, make, make use of it. Um, because it codifies or assesses uh, human personality. <clears throat> it's used in a wide range of contexts, including uh, individual um, and uh, relationship counseling, um, clinical psychology, uh, career counseling, employment testing. And what it does is it, is it measures the characteristic patterns of, of traits 
that uh, people exhibit across a vast uh, array of uh, situations. But I bring that up because, you know, it doesn't take the place of what God is doing uh, in our lives. Um, it doesn't exempt you from that. It doesn't supersede it. It doesn't invalidate it. I mean, God's got his own assessment <laughs> program in place for all of God's people, for his people, for his church. Think about it. In relation to orthodoxy, our minds being rightly informed, he has established his church as the pillar and foundation of truth. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. He's equipped the church with teachers who can rightly discern uh, the word of God. <clears throat> and, uh, and so that we should be very thankful that we are in congregations where uh, there is a, a high standard uh, for the faithful preaching and teaching of God's word. <clears throat> We think also of the way God tests his people, and this is clearly evident in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. James brings it up as well in James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, where it's, it's a, a, a testing of our faith <clears throat> through the various trials uh, that we endure. And um, all to say that we are being um, told to supplement our faith through these experiences, supplement our faith so that our character is not being um, ignored or neglected, but we continue to grow in Christ's likeness in this way. And so our orthopraxy um, is rightly addressed. Right? Our wills uh, are rightly informed. And there's a, a, a third area, um, and we look at uh, the emotional aspect, orthopathy. <clears throat> Here, too, God rightly informs our emotions. Um, I can't help but think, uh, as a teacher, um, one of the things that um, are, is, is bring, being brought out uh, in, uh, in quite a... Um, accented way is the social-emotional learning where um, the educators are saying, hey, there's a connection between their ability to learn academically and their understanding of who they are emotionally and uh, knowing their emotions and knowing how to manage their emotions has a lot to do with their ability uh, to understand um, academically uh, the concepts that are being taught, and it's 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 a good it's a good move. Um, but but in the church, it's it's quite apparent. God wants us to be emotionally moved, and 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 on the anvil of Christ's uh, affections being hammered uh, with that that sorrow, with that pain. And, and being made emotionally malleable. And so at the very seat of emotions, our personality at the deepest level is being molded and shaped into the likeness of Christ. All the affections of Christ, Paul says, I long for you with the affections of Christ. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1, verse 8. <clears throat> and so we see <clears throat> the importance of dealing um, with the, the impediments. Anything that would impede our way needs to be dealt with. We need to either remove ourselves from those things or we need to deal with them <clears throat> and repent. Repent. <clears throat> So I'd like to uh, bring, us, bring our attention to the second point uh, of our message. <clears throat> so not only, <clears throat> uh, not only am I removing 
the impediments or removing myself from the impediments, but do I rely on the provisions uh, for growth? <clears throat> this is a, a daily, a daily feeding on Christ for that energy, that, that nourishment, um, that we might be sustained in, in, and by his, his superabounding grace and knowledge. We are called to grow in the grace. So we leave behind, we turn from those things, we repent of those things, and we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's grace and knowledge, they're like, <clears throat> like spectacles, like glasses. Okay? Um, they're holding two lenses <clears throat> in front of my eyes, and they help us to advance in our Christian walk. Um, they work together to, to cause us to advance in that way. So when we talk about uh, the first lens of grace, <clears throat> uh, we could be either talking about the undeserved love and favor in Jesus Christ, or we could be talking about uh, the graces, the beauties, and the excellencies of Christian character. Either way, it does not change the point that we are to be daily increasing. There's to be that increasing capacity um, within our lives. There has to be a, a daily progressive transformation into his likeness, um, a daily increasing of the possessions of the gifts of his grace. So what the grace of God does is it immediately directs the eye of faith to the giver. That's, a, that's essentially what Paul, uh, what Peter is saying here, grow in the grace of God. See Christ from whom this grace is given. And the second lens is the knowledge. This directs our eye immediately to its object. <clears throat> the object of this knowledge is Christ. It's a knowledge that's, that's wrapped up in, in him, in Christ. And we don't need to see it as, I got to run here to this seminar, and I got to go hear this preacher and, and so that I get everything I need. No, no, you're looking at it completely wrong. As good as those things are to take in a good seminar and to hear a sermon uh, based on the word of God, no. The starting point is that the germ or the seed of Christ has been planted within you. And so when you're in the Word of God and the Spirit is working powerfully, it's Christ in you who is growing in all aspects and molding and shaping us, our minds, our wills, our emotions. It is Christ in you. <clears throat> we look, secondly, at what holds those lenses before our spiritual eyes, right? The framers, the, the frames that hold the lenses, the framers of grace and knowledge. And God has given uh, his church two great provisions um, or catalysts, we might say, both of which are living and active, his word and his spirit, both of which major on the offer of grace and knowledge. So they frame grace and knowledge before our eyes. So the two major dispensers of grace and knowledge are the word and the spirit. So the word of grace and knowledge. Jesus says, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn, learn, learn of me. For I am meek and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. We are to enroll in the school of Christ. The word of God in Christ is vital to our healthy growth in him. His word is the action. Okay? Our word, it might not be connected to action at all. 
when it comes to God's word, it is action. He speaks and it's done. He speaks and it, things are created. It accomplishes what it was sent out to do. The word of God is powerful. We must take great care then that we do not fail to see in all of Scripture <clears throat> the Lord and Savior of our souls. Think of the two men on the way to Emmaus, how their hearts were inflamed with that, with that longing for him, that desire to have him near them. What a blessing as he opened the Scripture to them, showing them uh, throughout all of Scripture um, how these things were prophesied concerning him. <clears throat> Did you know that the uh, third president <clears throat> of the United States had a secret? Yeah, he did. I didn't know this uh, until fairly recently. Um, he had a carefully edited version of the New Testament. He did. Um, he took four different uh, translations in um, and he literally took a razor and cut out all the things he believed and he pasted them into his own version. Um, there were two volumes and one of them has uh, survived and is in the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. <clears throat> he believed that Jesus was a man of morals. And so what he was doing in, with the razor, cutting all these passages out that he believed, he was leaving out or excising all the things that he didn't believe. He didn't believe in the deity of Christ. He didn't believe in the miracles that were performed by Christ and by the apostles. He wanted to have some kind of... Um, connection with, with the church, um, but in name, in name only, because what he was doing, essentially, was destroying the very dispenser of grace and knowledge. He was destroying the word of God. So the grace of God, in its entirety, is a tailor-made plan enacted and empowered by the word of the shepherd of our souls, by the word of the shepherd of our souls. So we submit, therefore, to the word of God. It is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It reproves, it corrects, it encourages, it comforts in Christ. Hallelujah. The second uh, dispenser or catalyst um, of grace and knowledge is the Spirit. The Spirit, I will not leave you as orphans, Jesus said. I will send my Spirit. He will lead you into all truth. Hmm. The Spirit of Christ is vital <clears throat> to our healthy growth in Him. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 to 18, that the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Paul says again in Romans chapter 8, verses 9 to 10, in a very short portion of God's word, he refers to the Spirit of Christ, uh, excuse me, the Spirit of God being in you. And then synonymously, he says, the Spirit of Christ is in you. And then he reasons with them, and if Christ is in you, how wonderful. How wonderful that is. <clears throat> How beautiful. So we must take great care that we do not deny the person of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes in our circles, we are so intent on dealing with the errors of those who go too far in saying that we should see this, we should see the Spirit doing this or that or the other thing, uh, that we swing so violently that we end up falling in the ditch on the other side. We don't even realize there's a ditch on the other side. The Spirit of Christ cannot be stripped of his power without doing grave damage.
to yourself. So in a very real sense, to deny the person of the Holy Spirit is to deny the person of Jesus Christ. And so again, I say, the means of grace in its entirety is a tailor-made plan implemented and encouraged by the spirit of the shepherd of our souls. We submit, therefore, to the Spirit of God. We keep in step with the Spirit. We pray in the Spirit. We put on the fruit of the Spirit. So I'd like to take us to the third um, question for this morning concerning our growth um, in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, Am I achieving the goals? Uh, This is the increasing love, the increasing love and communion that you have for the one who loved you first. For our passage says, of the Lord and Savior. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is his name. Lord and Savior are his uh, attributes characteristics. And we know that, you know, to him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity, um, is the overarching goal to give glory to God. But in these terms, Lord and Savior, we see additional goals. So the first one And again, all all three that I'm going to enumerate um, have the great purpose of directing us to the inner sanctum of his holiness and love. So the first goal is our reciprocal roles to Lord and Savior. Our reciprocal roles. So when we talk about Lord, we're talking about a servant friend, a servant friend, who talks face to face with God. Yes, that's the relationship. That's what I'm talking about. A servant friend. We call him Lord. And the aspect of Savior, our reciprocal role to him as Savior, is that we are a saved sinner. We are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. And we are on display um, with our Savior. Think of the thief on the cross. Think on the thief of the cross. Didn't have much remaining time left to advance in sanctification. Um, and yet, clearly, he submitted to the Lordship of Christ. It's not just this day uh, you will be with me in eternity. Um, But Christ so made use of the bending of the knee of this thief that to this very day we read of him and are blessed as we read of this um, depiction and this uh, exchange on the cross. Secondly, the second goal is our corresponding transformation by our Lord and Savior. And so there is this welling desire within us, as the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 to 14, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. There is a relationship that is established, and there is a ongoing change, a transformation that is taking place, and there is a pushing to know more. There is a great desire to know Christ and uh, to know of the power of his resurrection. And so be made more and more into his likeness. There's a third goal, 
and that is our reasonable service or our act of worship to our Lord and Savior or for our Lord and Savior. Think of, the, uh, think of Peter, who the Lord was causing to grow in, uh, in his grace and knowledge <clears> to <throat> the Lord concerning, do you love, do you love me <laughs> more than these? And three times Peter had, and, and, and finally he said, Lord, you know all things. You're my Lord. You know all things. You know that I love you. You know that I bend the knee before you as my Savior. See, Peter's growth, that is, his repentance, um, his increase, his progress, his maturity, uh, and so forth, in the Christian life. It, it's a wonderful example of what it means uh, to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Occasionally I'll come across a, um, a song, <clears throat> um, and I like, I like to look at the lyrics um, because sometimes we get used to hearing certain things or singing uh, songs and the words are second nature. And we're not really thinking about what we're saying. Um, but in this song, uh, the, uh, the author says, give me rules, I will break them. Show me lines, I will cross them. I need more than a truth to believe, and here it is, I need a truth that lives, moves, and breathes to sweep me off my feet. Uh, well, this is what the truth I need looks like. So there's orthodoxy, orthopraxy, orthopathy, all coming together. It looks like Jesus Christ. I am in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Savior. And then suddenly Christ's warning to the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 makes total sense. You have abandoned your first love. You've got all theologically, you've got everything lined up in a row. But if you don't repent, I'm going to remove my candlestick from your church, from your midst. What? You have abandoned the love you had at first. Growth is nothing less than the design of Christ to beautify his body. And if we neglect our own growth plan, Christ will give that honor to others, for he is jealous for his church. Let us rather offer up Moses' cry. You might say an updated New Testament version of Moses' cry. What did Moses cry? He said, Lord, if, if your presence does not go with us, don't carry us up from here. And we would say, oh, Lord, oh, God, if the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ does not go with us with his word and with his spirit, do not, go with the, do not carry us up from here. But, Lord, I will deny myself. I will take up my cross, and I will follow you today. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you how it addresses uh, our, our person, our personality, our being, uh, to the very core, uh, to the seat of our emotions, our mind, and our wills. And Lord, we want, it, we want you to reign there. We want you to apply the blood there. We want you to speak powerfully there. We want you to be our prophet, priest, and king. 
in every aspect of our lives. And so give glory to you both now and forevermore. Amen.